Hi, this is John Linnebal of John Linnebal Tutoring, and this is AP U.S. History Video 48, Government Promotion of the Territorial Expansion in the West. If you like this video, please, please, please like, comment, share, and subscribe, and here is my contact information if you want to contact me. All right, let's get going. Government Promotion of Western Expansion. As you can see from these ads, basically in 18, you know, the 1860s, the Homestead Acts were passed, and ads like this came out encouraging people to go and buy these lands and settle on them. And you can see that they were, in quotes, offered to actual settlers only, and you can see the prices here, etc. So $1.25 if you're outside the land, the railroad land grant limits, or $2.50 per acre inside the limits. All right, so pre-Civil War, people moved out west without any government encouragement just because they could see a good deal when they got one, and they figured, all right, I'm not happy with living back east. Let's go west. The government, basically, during and after the Civil War, actually passed laws to encourage settlement and development of the west. The Democrats' absence from Congress during the Civil War meant that Republicans could pass otherwise unpassable laws to improve the United States. So these laws included the Homestead Act, the Moral Land Grant Act, and the Pacific Railroad Act. And these acts helped the Republicans enforce their free labor ideology, the idea that people should be free to be able to work on their land, have land and farms, etc., and or be artisans doing kind of industrial or mechanic, as they say, you know, basic kinds of industrial work or agricultural work. So you might say, well, I don't know, John. I mean, that seems funny because you think Democrats would be more happy to help people and the Republicans would be the conservatives who would be a little bit more skeptical. That's because the Democrats of the 1860s and around that era were very similar to the Republicans of today. So, and the Basically, the Republicans were very much for progress, a progressive kind of agenda, you know, that would help people out. And they were very similar to today's Democrats. Sometime between back then and now, Democrats and Republicans kind of switched places. And we will learn about that in future videos. But... Anyway, at this point, you just have to know that since the Democrats were basically members of the party that dominated the southern states that seceded as soon as the Civil War started and the southern states were no longer part of the United States, all of these laws could get published, not published, well, they could get published, but first they had to get passed. They could get passed much more easily because all their opponents were no longer part of this country. So we got this. The Moral Land Grant Acts. These were passed in 1862 and they promoted secondary and post-secondary education mostly in the West. Basically the federal government transferred large tracts of land to the states. You should definitely watch this movie called Monty Python's The Holy Grail. There's a scene where they go, she's got huge tracts of land. Anyway, it's much funnier when you watch the movie, but those of you who get the reference, I'm sure you thought it was hilarious. Otherwise, I, I'm sorry, I'll get back to this. So the states could either establish state colleges on the land that they were granted, or they could take the land and sell it and then use the money to fund education. Land-grant colleges were meant to train and educate Westerners and also people back east, but mostly intended to help people in the new Western territories that would later become states to have places where they could be trained for agricultural purposes and other purposes as well. Act. In February 8, 1853, the Illinois legislature adopted a resolution drafted by Turner calling for Illinois 
congressman to work to pass a land grant bill to fund the system of industrial colleges, one in each state. Senator Lyman Trumbull of Illinois believed the best strategy was to have an Eastern representative sponsor the bill. Two months later, Representative Justin Smith of Vermont introduced the bill. Unlike the Turner plan, which provided each state with an equal land grant, <laughs> land grant, I should say, also it should be not and equal, it should be an, A-N, with no D on the end. All right, you know what, I'm going to do this over again. Adapted from the Wikipedia article, Moral Land Grant Acts, the political movement for the creation of agricultural colleges started about 20 years before the first introduction of the Moral Land Grant Acts in 1857. The movement was led by Professor Jonathan Baldwin Turner of Illinois College. For example, the Michigan Constitution of 1850 demanded an agricultural school be created, but the statute establishing it was not passed until February 12th of 1855. This was the United States' first agricultural college, the Agricultural College of the State of Michigan. It is now Michigan State University. Michigan State became... Michigan's State College, Michigan State University, became a model for the Moral Act. And in case you're wondering, Michigan State University and the University of Michigan are not the same thing. Anyway, February 8, 1853, the Illinois legislature adopted a resolution drafted by Turner calling for the Illinois congressman to work to pass a land-grant bill to fund a system of industrial colleges, one in each state. Senator Lyman Trumbull of Illinois believed the best strategy was to have an Eastern representative sponsor the bill. Two months later, Representative Justin Smith of Vermont introduced the bill. Unlike the Turner Plan, which provided each state with an equal Grant, the Moral Bill distributed land for each state based on its number of senators and, con and con I'll try that again, and congressional representatives. This favored the eastern states who had a larger population. The Moral Act was proposed in 1857, that was the first time it was proposed, and it was finally passed by Congress in 1859, but President James Buchanan vetoed that 1859 bill. In 1861, Morrill resubmitted the act, adding the provision that the colleges would also teach military tactics as well as engineering and agriculture. Since most of the states that opposed the previous bills had seceded, the amended Morrill Act was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln on July 2nd, 1862. The purpose of the land-grant land grant colleges, adapted from the Wikipedia article, Moral Land Grant Acts. So the purpose of the land-grant colleges was, and I quote, without excluding other scientific and classical studies and including military tactic, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agricultural agriculture, I should say, and the mechanic arts. That's anybody who's skilled with tools, etc., or, you know, artisans, you know, not, not artists, but people who work with things that are useful and that, you know, many of them are kind of the mechanical things that we think of when we think of a mechanic. But I digress. Anyway, in such a manner as the legislatures of the states may respectively prescribe in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits of the professions in life. So, from the early to mid-1800s, the federal government, through 162 violence-backed sessions, expropriated approximately 10.7 million acres of land from 245 tribal nations and divided it into roughly 80,000 parcels for redistribution. That's a Wikipedia, Wikipedia quote. Pretty radical, but pretty accurate, at least to the sense that 
if you were looking at this and thinking, oh, isn't it great? There was all this completely empty land that people could just come from the United States, come from back east and settle our western United States. That's not what happened. There were Native Americans who had to be basically pushed away so there was land for these other settlers to come in. Anyway, each eligible state got 30,000 acres or 120 square kilometers of federal land within or next to its boundaries, and that's per each congressperson the state had as of the 1860 census. This land or funds from its sale was meant to establish and fund the educational institutions described above. Provision 6 of the Act stated, No state while in a condition of rebellion or insurrection against the government of the United States shall be entitled to the benefit of this Act, referring, of course, to the secession of the southern states during the Civil War. Land-grant colleges are established. Despite the exclusion of former Confederate states from the 1862 Act, the Act actually did extend every state and territory, including the former Confederate states uh, and including states that were created after 1862, the same rights to have a land-grant land grant college. And so, if the federal land within a state was insufficient to meet that stand, that, not that stands, that state's land grant, the state was allowed to select federal lands in other states to fund its land grant college. In one case, New York State carefully selected valuable timber land in Wisconsin to fund Cornell University, which produced about one third of the total grant of the total revenues generated by all states, although New York's share was only one-tenth of the 1862 land grant. That's pretty good. They took a one-tenth share, made it a one-third share. So roughly 3.3, you know, 3, 3, 3, 3, you know, three and a third times what their investment was. That's pretty awesome. And the total land set aside by the 1862 Morrill Act was 17,400,000 acres or 70,000 square kilometers, the sale of which yielded a collective endowment of $7.55 million. I'm sure that's an 1862 dollars, so that's a lot of money. Anyway, on September 12, 1862, Iowa was the first state to accept the terms of the Morrill Act founding the State Agricultural College and Model Farm, later renamed Iowa State University of Science and Technology. The first land-grant institution to open was Kansas State University, which was established on Fe February 16, 1863, so you can see that's after when after Iowa's university was founded, but they opened on September 2nd, 1863, so they opened before Iowa uh, opened their university. With a few exceptions, including Cornell University and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, nearly all of the land-grant colleges are public. Cornell University, while it's private, does administer several state-supported contract colleges that fulfill its public land-grant mission to the state of New York. And so I remember when I interviewed, well, interviewed with Cornell and I went and visited the campus and everything and went on a, on the tour where they explained what's going on. And one of them did, one of the tour guides did have to actually say, well, if you go to one of these contract colleges, it's really, you know, not going to let you go through any loopholes. So you can't say, oh, I want to major in agriculture or engineering that's covered in these schools, and then say, you know, but I've decided now I want to major in film or something like that. You know, no, if you do that, at the very least, you're going to have to pay the difference, you know, and pay for the college, you know, for the education at the private part of Cornell. But I digress. Anyway. To maintain their status as land-grant colleges, a number of programs are required to be maintained by the college. These programs include agriculture, engineering, and an ROTC, that's Reserve Officers Training Corps program. So, you know, hey, they did say military, so there's your military ROTC. Agriculture, engineering, of course, 
Remember, they were looking at things that would help with agriculture and, you know, internal improvements and da da da, industry in general. So obviously, agricultural and engineering education would be key towards developing a country as far as its agriculture and its industry. All right, let's. Land grant colleges transform American education. The land grant colleges transformed engineering education in America and established the U.S. as a world leader in technical education. Before the Civil War, American colleges mostly taught classical studies and the liberal arts as they were training grounds for the wealthy. Doesn't mean that classical studies and liberal arts aren't important to other people, but that's the way it was. The entrance requirements often required proficiency in the Latin and ancient Greek languages, effectively excluding the working class. The military academy, that is West Point, was the college that trained American engineers mostly in fortress construction. The West Point instructors were the authors of most antebellum, you know, that is before the Civil War, engineering texts. The Morrill Act changed that. While the congressional debates about the act were mostly about agriculture, the act's language included language referring to the mechanic arts, meaning applied science and engineering. The act specifically forbade spending land-grant endowments on building construction, which Congress believed was expensive and unnecessary. As such, those funds were spent on the tools for engineering education, such as textbooks, laboratories, and other scientific equipment. So, let's move on. Ha, huh, this doesn't want to move on. All right, so the result was that the number of engineers skyrocketed. In 1866, there were about 300 American men who had degrees in engineering and only six reputable colleges granting them. But by 1870, there were 21 colleges offering engineering degrees and the total number of engineers graduated had tripled to 866. By 1880, the U.S had added another 2,249 engineers, and by 1911, the U.S. was graduating 3,000 engineers per year, with a total of 38,000 in the workforce. Meanwhile, Germany, well known for its science and engineering, was graduating only 1,800, you know, 1,800 engineers per year. So we can see some marvelous bridges from Niagara Falls, New York, not too far from where I grew up. And here's an engineer, like the engineer driving the train. Ha, 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 ha. You know, engineers don't like jokes like that very much, but anyway. And of course, here's some German engineering, a Mercedes-Benz automobile. So it's not like the Germans are any slouches in engineering, but the U.S. definitely managed to pump out the quantity while the Germans had the quality, of course, the U.S. said, hey, we can have quality and quantity in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So, wow, this thing doesn't like to move. Here we go. Now let's talk about the Pacific Railroad Acts. So this law, again from 1862, and supplemental laws issued government bonds and granted to rail companies the right to create transcontinental railroads. The federal government gave 130 million acres to these companies. States added 50 million extra acres to that total. So a total of 180 million acres of state and federal land went to railroads to develop the West. So here's a plaque about the Texas and Pacific Gale. Railway and the Union Central, you know, da da da. And he, here's the only direct route from Omaha to San Francisco. All right. So here's a little bit more on the Pacific Railroad Act. The original 1862 Act's long title was an act to aid the construction of a railroad and telegraph line from the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean and to secure the government use of same 
for postal, military, and other purposes. And yes, I should have said the same instead of same. Anyway, we can see why these long titles are pretty long and unwieldy, and usually they give it a, a bit of a snappier, shorter title like the Pacific Railroad Acts. So, this was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln on July 1st, 1862. The 1862 Act created extensive land grants, a ah, huge tract of land, in the western United States. And the government issued 30-year bonds at 6% interest to Union Pacific Railroad and Central Pacific Railroad, which later became the Southern Pacific Railroad companies, in order to construct a continuous tra transcontinental railroad between the eastern side of the Missouri River at Council Bluffs, Iowa, opposite from Omaha, Nebraska, and the navigable waters of the Sacramento River in Sacramento, California. Section 2 of the Act granted each company contiguous, you know, so together, rights of way for their rail lines as well as all public lands within 100 feet or 30 meters on each side of the track. Section 3 granted an additional 10 square miles, 26 square kilometers, of public land for every mile of grade except where railroads ran through cities or crossed rivers. Okay, little technical detail, but that's important to say, okay, here's some public land, da, da, da. we need the, that to go with the, with the railroads. And the 30-year U.S. government bonds authorized by the Act would be issued and backed by the U.S. government, which would then provide the capital raised to the railroad companies on completion of sections of the railroads in exchange for a lien on that section. So we'll give you the money, but we're going to get a lien. So it's like a mortgage on a house or the loan on your car. It's like, okay, we'll lend you the money and we'll let you build it, but until you pay us back... You know, we actually own that thing. You don't own it. Just like you buy a car on credit, you don't really own the car. You only own the equity that you actually paid. Same thing with a mortgage on your house. You only own what you actually paid the mortgage company. The mortgage company owns the rest of it and can get a lien against it and can even foreclose and different things. But I digress. Anyway. The liens covered by the railroads and all their fixtures and the loans, you know, those became due and they were repaid in full and with interest by the companies and as and when they became due. So basically they made good on it. They made lots of money. So even at 6% interest, it was enough that people would definitely pay money to go on these railroads rather than trying to take ships all around the country, you know, really, really kind of practically around the globe. You know, it's like, okay, I had to go around the Horn, you know, South America, et cetera, to get from, say, New York City to San Francisco, whereas like, oh, you mean I can get on a railroad that goes right through there? Oh, yeah, okay, that's a good investment. So it was a pretty good way for them to make money and pay off these, uh, pay off these loans, and basically these companies mostly exist to this day. So here we go. More on the Pacific Railroad Acts. So, Section 10 of the 1864 Amending Act, 13 Statutes at Large, 356, additionally authorized the two charting companies to issue their own first mortgage bonds in um, total amounts up to, but not exceeding that of the bonds issued by the United States, and such that the company issued securities would have priority over the government bonds. So, okay, so they could get their own bonds and da-da-da-da-da, but not over what the government issued them, and then the, these company-issued securities would have priority over the government bonds. But remember, if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, is that going to mess up the government bonds? No, the government still had a lien on it until they were paid off, you know, the lien on the physical railroad. So they were being taken care of. But they're saying, okay, we'll let you borrow money and you can use that to, if someone else will borrow, you know, we'll refinance it. Basically, we can use this money to pay off the, you know, basically they can borrow more money. That's basically what it is. Okay, so the amending act of March 3rd, 1865 ratified and confirmed the assignment made by the 
Central Pacific Railroad to the Western Pacific Railroad to construct the westernmost leg of the Pacific Railroad from Sacramento to San Jose and authorized West, the Western Pacific as one of the charter companies. So, okay. So, built some more railroad from Sacramento to San Jose. Do you know the way to San Jose? And it authorized the Western Pacific as one of the charter companies. And from 1850 to 1871, the railroads received more than 175 million acres of public land, one-tenth of which, you know, of the whole United States and larger in area than Texas. The railroad expansion provided new paths of migration into the American interior. The railroads sold portions of their land to arriving settlers at a great profit. Okay, so that's why people were willing to take up these bonds, because they knew they were going to get money. And that's why the federal government was like, yeah, that's okay, you can take out these bonds, because we know there's going to be plenty of money to go around. All right, pretty good deal for everybody. Anyway... So that was 175 million acres of public land, one-tenth of the whole United States, and larger in area than the whole state of Texas. So the railroad expansion provided new paths of migration into the American interior. The railroads sold portions of their land to arriving settlers, as I just said before. The lands closest to the tracks grew the highest prices, as we saw before. Remember at the beginning when there was the ad saying, well, okay, if you want to be right within the, uh, the Moral Land Grant Act, Lands you had to pay two hundred. You, know, you had to pay two dollars and fifty cents per acre, whereas you were outside it, you only had to pay half. You paid you know one point two five, a dollar twenty five. So that's because farmers and ranchers wanted to locate near railroad stations because obviously that would make it a lot easier to take their livestock or their grain or whatever produce and just put it right onto railroad cars, whereas otherwise you might have to have some, you know, horse and buggy or something like that, basically take it over to where the trail, you know, where the train depot was. So that makes perfect sense. And so this was definitely an exciting time for the West. All right. And more on the Pacific Railroad Act. In the Act of 1863... This set the gauge, basically the space between railroad rails. So you can see green, that's one kind of gauge. Purple were another, then the red were another. So these are Australian triple gauge rail, railway track. But we can see narrow gauge, narrow gauge, meter gauge, standard gauge. Okay. So basically the gauge was set at four feet and one and eight and one half inches gauge previously used when the 1863 act was passed. And this gauge was used by George Stephenson for England's Liverpool and Manchester Railroad 18. 18- 30 that became popular you know became popular with railroads in the northeastern united states and it was widely but not universally adopted in the u.s today you know so today it's just called standard gauge because most you know basically most railroads use it so we can see standard gauge is over here and then there's broad gauge so that's if it's a little wider Anyway, it's a common gauge, standard gauge. That's an easy choice because then you can just basically use all cars and engines and stuff that all have the same width. Otherwise, if you change the width of the track, then you have to use cars and an engine, etc. that are different width. So obviously that's hard. The more you standardize mechanical things like this, especially where you have to interchange a lot of parts, it's easier just to make everything the same width, etc. And so, oh, we see the right to, you know, anyway. It also allows transfer of cars between different railroad companies and facilitates trackage rights. And you can see the right, okay, check out the T, oops, sorry about that, to run trains over certain tracks with or without the right to move passengers or freight or freight okay i'm not talking so great i'm sorry about that anyway basically 
if you have a standard gauge, makes it easier to do everything, especially if you have to transfer trains, cars, etc., from one railroad to another railroad. And, you know, at the very least, everybody can do it. You can think of it like freeways, highways, roads, etc. It's nice if cars are all roughly the same, same width, so that way everybody can be in the same side, roughly the same size you know, lanes on a freeway. So same thing. And it's even more important where you have a railroad because the things actually have to be on rails. So you can also think of previous history. I remember from my European history classes years ago in, in high school, the some rulers and European and Asian and whatever countries, basically they ordered that all the carts and wagons, etc., used by peasants in the military, anybody else who might be using wagons, that they all that the wheels all had to be the same width or the same gauge, if you will. So that way invading armies that use different ages wouldn't be able to use the well worn road ruts in dirt roads. You know, the idea is you have dirt roads, all the carts are the same length, they're going to basically put roads in the same, you know, put ruts in the same place, especially since the carts will just naturally find their way into the ruts. So that way, if you're using an enemy's wagons that use different widths, different gauges, it's not going to work as well. And let's look at the Thurman Act, an act of Congress, May 7th, 1878, to Statutes 57, which was an amendment to solve disputes over the railroad subsidies, revenues, and loan repayments consequential to the original act. So it's basically house cleaning, financial stuff, etc. Important, but not terribly interesting at this point. The Homestead Act. So the federal government encouraged Western development through this law, 1862. We talked about that, which granted free land to anyone willing to develop it. This supported the idea of free labor, and again, you know, since the Democrats were generally from the South, they were like modern Republicans, and the Republicans were more like today's Democrats. Basically, the Republicans, since they were from the North, they were the only ones who got to vote during the Civil War, so they had no opposition when the South succeeded, so that's how these things got passed. And you can see things here, you know, even after the Civil War, you have things like, Ho! For Kansas! They mean go to Kansas, get your mind out of the gutter. But anyway, this was actually aimed at African Americans who had, you know, of course, had been slaves, etc. And they were given a way to obtain real estate in Kansas. So they would be leaving Nashville, Tennessee to go to Kansas and would have to pay in pursuit of homes in the southwestern lands of United you know, of America at transportation rates cheaper than ever was known before. And Benjamin Singleton, better known as Old Pap, okay, so you could see where you could go. Beware of speculators and adventurers. That is a dangerous thing to fall into their hands. So, you know, don't get ripped off. Go to Old Pap. Okay, I don't know if I would trust Old Pap here, but anyway, hope things worked out for these people. So, the problem is, is that most homesteaders, many homesteaders, maybe not most, but many of them, didn't know how to farm, and they ended up going bankrupt, and, you know, so presumably their land got foreclosed on by some bank or something like that, so they ended up off their land, probably in a city, maybe, I don't know, Omaha, something like that, whatever, maybe they went back east, maybe they went to California, I don't know. But anyway, they ended up off their land. And so even those who actually knew how to farm pretty effectively still had a problem because larger farm operations could outcompete them in some ways. You know, just the more agricultural products you can grow, the lower per unit you can probably charge. So if you can basically compete on price, you might put the small farms out of business and force them to have to sell to your collective. It doesn't always work that way because, let's face it, 
somebody who's working their family farm is going to care a lot more and going to be willing to work a lot harder than somebody who's just a hired hand on some agribusiness where it's like, okay, you know, American conglomerated, you know, blah, 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 agribusiness. The guy who's earning a wage is not going to feel the same as, this has been my land since the Homestead Act when my great-great-grandfather Silas uh, and his wife, you know, da -da -da, you know founded this, and I will do anything I have to do to make this survive. So I'm sure you get the point. On that note, thanks for listening to this video and watching it. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why? It's really simple. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have a thousand subscribers and four thousand hours. That's two hundred and forty thousand minutes of view time in a year. While many people are watching these videos, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time in the last year. I do, however, have 1,000 subscribers, actually more than 1,000 subscribers at this time. So thank you so much to everyone who actually helped me out by subscribing. Ad money will help me make more of these videos. And speaking of ad money, if you've seen an ad during this video or my other videos, please know that I did not get any of the ad money and I won't until I have the subscribers and view time that YouTube demands. For the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos that are also constructive. I reserve the right to delete comments such as troll posts or spam for obvious reasons. Nobody likes trollers and spam. You can hire me for tutoring. We can do it online through Zoom or some other similar internet platform, or we can meet in person. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so if you're around there, it's pretty easy for me to come see you. I do travel to other cities sometimes, so you can always contact me and ask me if I'm going to be in your city, and that's another way that I might be able to meet with you in person. Thanks for watching, and my contact information follows. You can contact me on Facebook, Facebook dot com forward slash Linaball tutoring all one word Instagram it's Instagram dot com forward slash John dot Linaball dot tutoring and the phone number this is my cell phone four one five six two three four two five one you can always call me or leave a text message email you can always email me at John at John Linaball dot com website you can reach me at John Linaball dot com or John Linaball tutoring dot com they take you to the same website. And you can also find me at testpreparation.locals.com and at lbry.tv at John Linneval Tutoring. That's a nifty little site, lbry.tv. My actual postal mail address is John Linneval Tutoring at 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. And finally, please note this video is not a substitute for your classes, etc., or the text or anything else. This video is based on Barron's AP U.S. History Review Book, the fourth edition. Some of them it's the fifth edition. Anyway, or any other sources used in the video description and my general knowledge of U.S. history. While these videos should all help you do well on the AP U.S. history exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please, please, please read your class texts and please pay attention to what your teacher says in class because that will help you do well on the tests and homework etc that are not the actual AP US history exam. All right, have a nice day.